Jonathan and Downs, leaders and the saints of Calvary Church. Let me greet you all in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. My name is Digi Sanakari, the General Secretary of UPA Papua New Guinea. I would like to convey my uh, gratefulness to you, your leaders and the saints of Calvary for coming up with a very timely and great donation to us to help our Bible school as well as our headquarters office operational for the next couple of months. Actually, we are planning to lay off some workers due to financial situation, but thank God who knows the needs of his people, begin to impress your heart to come up with a very such a very great blessing to us. We would like to thank you once again for your help and support. Our prayers are with you, and uh, the Lord will continue to bless you, your ministry, and the church as a whole. Thank you. God bless you. I'm uh, Pastor Jimmy One Piece. Actually, I'm the administrative coordinator of UPA PNG. Thank you for your assistance, and uh, thank you also to the church and congregation who help us. Thank you very much, and God bless you all. Thank you, Lord. Time when we like time no good way come up from the plan or one in the lockdown. We plus also thank you, Lord. You were helping me plan of PND sets, Pavoni sets where you were thinking me plan helping me plan. I want them through spirit and a family and a midla all staffs and a middle in silo sets headquarters. Thank you. No one else was something we buy me so. Thank you, Lord. Sets where you look out in lane and family. All got a midla talk. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. During this pandemic period, we don't know where will we go, but uh, we're just staying in the compound, and uh, we are so glad and thank God that uh, you have that art to help us in PNG. Uh, we don't have anything to give you, but we'll always pray for you and your church and your family, and uh, in due season, God will bless you. And we just want to say a very big thank you for your help towards us. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, donation to us. Uh, if it wasn't for you, uh, regarding this uh, COVID-19, we'll be uh, closing down our works here in the headquarters of the uh, UPA Papua New Guinea. And uh, also, the uh, Astu will be at home. But uh, thank you very much for your donation to us. It's helping us and helping uh, the work of the uh, UPA in PNG to go ahead. So thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Matthias Mangori and uh, I work here in the headquarters office as a Bible school secretary. I'm also teaching in the Bible school and uh, I am also a pastor, pastoring a local church here in my town. Uh, I want to take this time to uh, thank uh, you, uh, Reverend Downs, your leadership in the, in the church of uh, Calvary Chapel in Canberra, as well as all the saints in the, your local church for very timely assistance. Uh, we were told by our leaders that we are going to, anytime from now, we are going to send our office as we don't have funds because of the COVID-19 that is sweeping through uh, the world and it's also affecting uh, Papua New Guinea as well. But uh, we thank you very highly for the timely assistance that you are giving us. So let's believe that uh, it's going to take us for some months and uh, it's going to help us to do our work here also. And uh, for that, I want to uh, thank you very highly and we will continue to pray for you that uh, God is going to sustain his uh, hands upon you and your local church. So you will con continue to become the same support, same blessing to many people around the world. And I'm working in the Toda office. Uh, our boss said that um, this lockdown, we we are going to leave the office one uh, one week, uh, one one week. But uh, I thankful to God and also to you, Brother Downs, that you are thinking uh, PNG. It's a great blessing to Toda office. My daughter is doing great then, but we, if no money in the headquarter office, I'm planning to take my daughter with me back to Chimbu 
But God is so good to us, and I'm thankful to you, Bear Downs, that you are helping us, PNT. Thank you. I'd like to say thank you to uh, Pastor Jonathan Downs uh, and Calvin Church in Canberra for your generous support to our, our church in PNG and our general superintendent and wife. Because what you've done, you've uh, continued to keep us going in times of this uh, COVID-19 and we're still surviving in our country. So thank you very much and may God bless you. Thank you. I just want to say a big thank you to um, Reverend Jonathan Holmes for his full support and donation um, in Papua New Guinea, especially in the headquarters of Papua New Guinea. Thank you very much. A very big thank you to you, Pastor Jonathan Downs and Calvary Chapel, for your kind donation and generous giving to us and to the work of God in Papua New Guinea. Such a great help to us in this time of need to keep us going. We are blessed because of your love and support. May God bless you all. Life sails on troubled sea whenever there's a wind in my sail. But I have a friend who watches over me when the wind turns into a cave. joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me. The world didn't give it and the world cannot take it away. This joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me. This joy that I have, the world didn't that I have the world didn't give it to me the world didn't give it and the world can take it away this holy this holy ghost that I have 
the world been given to me No, 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 this Holy Ghost that I have The world been given to me This Holy Ghost that I have The world been given to me The world been given and the world can take it study. Uh, I'm quite excited about being here to teach you tonight and we certainly pray that as we open the word of God it will be a blessing to each of you. So we've been on the topic of habits of highly healthy homes and last week Brother Taylor spoke on the subject of honour your heritage. In this series we're studying the Ten Commandments. Some people say that the Ten Commandments are not for today. They say that it's all Old Testament and we're now in the New Testament. However, the Ten Commandments are the principles or the principle of God's morals. That was told us by Pastor Downs. They're the principles of God's morals. God does not change his morals, otherwise he has become immoral. Jesus stated in Matthew chapter 5, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, not one jot or tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Now we remember that, uh, that in the Old Testament that we had the moral law, we had the ceremonial law and we had the civil law. The moral law, as I've just said, is summed up in the Ten Commandments. At least they're the main principles. The ceremonial law was fulfilled in the New Testament. Th those things that was spoken of in the Old Testament were fulfilled in the New Testament. For instance, the Old Testament speaks about the blood of lambs being sacrificed and in the New Testament it was the blood of Jesus that was shed for us. And then also there was the civil law. These were the laws that God gave to the children of Israel. We have civil laws today for the road, how people are to behave themselves financially, and, and in many, many, many other ways. Here, 
Jesus is saying that he came to give us greater revelation into the moral law. In other words, he is going to shine a New Testament light on these Old Testament Ten Commandments. As he quotes each of them, as he quotes each of them, he says, but I say unto thee. In other words, this is what the Old Testament says, but I say unto thee. He puts New Testament meanings to these laws. Understanding this tonight will be of great assistance to us because otherwise we will think that the Old Testament uh, laws have no relevance today. This lesson tonight is on the Sixth Commandment and I'm fairly sure you don't need to look it up in the Bible but it's in Exodus chapter 20 verse 13. Thou shalt not kill. We could also say, thou shalt not murder. That's probably a more relevant way to put it. If we would put this in a 21st century sense, we would say that habit number six is to value the individual. This, this commandment means murder is the intentional killing of an innocent human being. You say, well, <laughs> that's pretty straightforward. I don't intend to kill anybody. I'll never do that. Well, tonight we're going to go a little bit deeper, probably to your discomfort. We're going to look closer and uh, we'll look at the added meaning that Jesus applies to this commandment. In doing so, we're going to look how anger is a form of abuse. In its basic form, this commandment states, no one but God has the right to take the life of an innocent human being. I mean, every one of us would naturally think this, that it's wrong to murder because God sustains. He created life and he sustains it. He alone has the right to number our days and also to determine when a person should die. So let's look at a couple of no-nos. No-no number one, God says no to murder. The prohibition against murder is spoken about in the first five books of the Bible. Every one of those books actually states this rule or this law, thou shalt not murder. But yet today, in the society we live in and the entertainment that we watch and enjoy, such as TV, movies and computer games, we have heroes, or at least supposed heroes, are depicted. And our children become somewhat, well, saying, I'd love to be like them. However, this entertainment does not reflect the true models of those who respect life. Rambo, you know, many of them, uh, uh, I'm not a a television watcher, so I probably can't list them off the top of my head, but I do know that they're out there and, and everybody just loves to sit down and watch these guys kill each other. Though they're certainly not good role models, role models of anger management either. Let me just tell you that I got some little illustrations here uh, when I was a, a young boy. Things have changed so much. Now, I don't really feel like I'm old, but in the time that I've lived, things have changed so much. My grandfather, who wasn't necessarily really a, a godly church-going man, he was, uh, we were all sitting around our black and white television set one night watching a, uh, a Western movie. And my grandfather stated in an obscure way, I think 
we should, we'll be surprised at the number of people that we've seen killed in the name of entertainment who lay dead in the back of our television sets. That was the statement he made. And then another statement I can make, uh, remember being made on a separate occasion by my grandmother on my mother's side. She, she was a very, very devout Christian. She said, the Bible says, thou shalt not kill. Yet how is it that we can find enjoyment watching people kill each other? Well, that's basically the way people felt back there then. But, you know, Hollywood has made human life very cheap. When you think of what we watch and what's available to be watched, even as people play their computer games and, and long to kill as many people as they possibly can. You see, the principle behind these four words, thou shalt not kill, goes beyond just putting these words in the statute book, in the book, in the laws of our society. There was a man, or is a man, called David Gossman. He is a military psychologist. He coined the term killology, and this means the study of methods and psychological effects of training military recruits to overcome their natural inhibition to kill fellow human beings. It's unnatural for us to want to kill anybody, and I think we all know that tonight. Except for sociopaths, killing requires training because of this inbuilt aversion to killing anybody of our species. And even if you look at it, even animals really don't kill their own species. But Gossman goes ahead and says in a definite way that the same tactics that are used in training our soldiers are at work in our media. I think every one of us tonight, parents and children, young people, we need to reflect upon this, that is it, is it really a wholesome thing to be sitting and be excited about people killing each other? Every time a child and an adult, for that matter, sees violent movies, they're actually being conditioned. The same way that soldiers are conditioned and police officers. But of course, there, there is a side to this that can be a little bit confusing because under the law of Moses, the Israelites practiced capital punishment and killing at war. First, let me say that through history, there has been some terrible things that have been done in the name of God, but I'm sure God never ever sanctioned it. I personally believe that war should be a last resort and desperate at that and basically in self-defence. Care should always be taken not to kill civilians. And then we have killing as a punishment. Yes, there, was, there were things in the Old Testament where if somebody broke those commandments they would actually be put to death in many cases, by stoning. And the Old Testament does instruct, the instructions come through God's civil law to Israel, that capital punishment was to be carried out in certain circumstances. So what do we say about this? Well, first of all, let's go to the scripture where it says, Whosoever sheddeth a man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For he was made in the image of God. Well, we could say, well, we don't have that in Australia. We don't have capital punishment in Australia. But in my lifetime, I can remember uh, when I lived in Melbourne about men being taken to the gallows and hung. But God does grant authority to governments to exercise capital punishment in limited circumstances. But I do believe that 
we should enjoy and, and, and line up in the streets and shout when somebody's executed. I think there should be great sorrow uh, around such executions, which we don't have in Australia. And, uh, and I, of course, if somebody's executed, it should be done with dignity. The second no-no tonight that we're studying is God says no to suicide. Way back in 2009, in Australia, there were 2,132 deaths registered as suicide. This is reported by the Australian Bureau of Statistics. Some people argue and say, well, it's my life. I have the right to live it and I have the right to end it. But the Bible doesn't agree with that. When Job is reflecting back to God, speaking back to God, this is what he says in Job chapter 14, verse 5. Our time on earth is brief. The number of our days is already decided by you. So he's admitting that it is God who decides our days. Well, I suppose many of us at times have fallen into enough despair, would even dare to think to ourselves, is life really worth living? Have you ever thought that? Well, if you ever do consider suicide, remember that there is hope in Jesus. There is always hope in Jesus. It's never too late. You will always find that you matter to God. One of the best things you could do if you're feeling inclined towards suicide would be pick up God's word and read about his love for you and the hope that he gives you. So number three now is the third no-no is God says no to mercy killing. To the young who are listening tonight, this is otherwise known as euthanasia. And the word euthanasia has a meaning such as beautiful death. There's nothing beautiful about it in the eyes of God. It means to intentionally cause the death of somebody, usually because of deformity, old age, or an incurable disease, or some other means. However, let me just clarify that this does not mean that when a person naturally dies because their artificial life support has to be removed. I have unfortunately been in a situation where somebody's life support had to be removed because they were brain dead and there's, no in, there's real no need to keep a person artificially alive because really they're dead already. There are other issues which we cannot cover tonight, but um, maybe I could summarise them with just saying there should be no intention by any of us to ever, ever shorten somebody's life. Euthanasia has been legal in, in Holland for at least 30 years and, and many years ago we had an elderly lady in our church. She was a Dutch lady. Uh, her name was Sister Elida Gould. And uh, I remember her saying to me that her elderly friends in Holland were too frightened to go to hospital because of involuntary euthanasia. In other words, if you went to hospital and the doctors deemed that you shouldn't be allowed to live anymore, then they would take your life. But it's only God who has the right to stop us living. Job 12 verse 10 says, It is God who directs the lives of his creatures. Every man's life is in his power. And now the crux of the whole issue with abortion, euthanasia, is, is that that allows man to judge what is a valid life and what is not a valid life. That doesn't belong to man. That belongs 
to God. The fourth no-no is God says no to abortion. Now I don't wish to condemn anybody tonight because maybe some that are watching this may have had an abortion at some times. I want to say that nearly every one of us have made some tragic mistakes in our lifetime. I'll address that in a minute, but it's estimated that about 80,000 and 90,000 surgical abortions are performed every year in Australia. The vast majority of these abortions are not because of rape or incest or because the mother's life is threatened. It's because people feel that their lifestyle is being destroyed or, in some cases, just a form of contraception. Let me read a very, very beautiful verse out of the scripture in the New Living Translation. It says in Psalm 139, verses 13 to 16. Just listen, <clears throat> because it, it has some very wonderful, deep meaning. The psalmist says, You made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit them together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvellous. And how well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion, as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. I don't think any of us could deny that life that life begins at conception. Just because the fetus is unrecognisable at that stage does not mean there is not life. There is life. So God says no to abortion. If you have had an abortion, then we have a God that forgives. He's a God of mercy. I'll get a little bit more to that later. The fifth no-no is God says no to verbal abuse. Wow, thou shalt not kill? Well, we're going to read a scripture in a minute where Jesus includes verbal abuse. God says no to verbal abuse. Jesus taught that there is little difference between murder and gossip and verbal abuse because they all flow from the same source, a hateful heart, and they all kill. You see, there's more ways to murder somebody than just one. We can destroy a person's reputation by gossip. Why do we gossip anyway? Usually we gossip because we want to put the other person under our feet and we want to rise above them. And then we can kill a person verbally by the things we say rather than commit physical murder. In other words, we've killed them in their heart by the words that we've said. And so let me read what Jesus said about the sixth commandment in Matthew chapter 5, 21 to 22. He says, You know that our ancestors were told, Do not murder, and a murderer must be brought to trial. But I promise you that if you are angry with someone, you will have to stand trial. If you call someone a fool, you'll be taken to court. And if you say that someone is worthless, you will be in danger of the fires of hell. This is verbal abuse. And here, Jesus links it up with thou shalt not murder. As I said, Jesus shines a New Testament light on the Old Testament commandments. 
When an unresolved murder is present in a relationship, it will not stay at that. It will eventually display itself in a hateful attitude that belittles the other person. If you go to the King James Version in these scriptures in Matthew chapter 5, 21 to 22, it uses the word raka, R-A-C-A. And that means, in using that word, it means to say, you are a good for nothing. Have you ever heard that? You are a good for nothing. You are worthless. Well, we better be careful about words like that because we're saying that about God's creation. And we've just read that we are all wonderfully and fearfully made by God. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 15, it says, If you hate each other, you are murderers. And we know that murderers do not inherit eternal life. And this may be making us comfortable because very often we, we justify our attitudes. We justify our hatred of certain people because they cross us or we don't agree with them in some way or maybe they've even hurt us. But you see, it says, if you hate one another, you're a murderer's. And we know that murderers do not have eternal life. And Jesus himself taught in what we know as the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. In other words, forgive us, Lord, because we forgive other people. But if you don't forgive, how can you expect God to forgive you? Jesus forgave us. And then in Ephesians chapter 4, 31 to 32, it says that all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamour and evil speaking, there's the gossip, be put away from you with all malice and be ye kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. Well, uh, anger, let's talk about that a little bit. I'll give you an illustration. A mother was becoming very, very angry with her son who had been back answering him. And she explained very loudly at him, I'm getting very, very angry with you. Sounds familiar to most of us, doesn't it? Particularly parents. The young boy responded back to his mother and said, Mum, you taught us that when we get very angry with someone and yell at them, it is like murder. <laughs> the mother grabbed her son and smacked him around the legs and said, the Bible also says, honour your mother and father. So <laughs> we need to, children, we need to be very careful about how we, we quote the Bible. Don't quote the Bible in one way and... and, uh, and and deny it in another. In Ephesians chapter 4 verse 26, it says, Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. In other words, deal with your anger. Don't let the sun go down upon your wrath. But this verse is telling us we can and all will be angry at some time or other. Anybody who's never been angry, who's listening to this lesson, I'd be very happy to meet you at some time when we gather again at the church because I'd pat you on the back and say you're an exceptional person. Why? Because every one of us are angry at some time or other. Situations happen to us. But there is a place for anger. May I say that to simply disagree with somebody is not necessarily expressing anger, even if, you, even if you do it in a strong way. That's not necessarily anger. But we must avoid uncontrollable rage in our disagreement. Be careful of the seeds of murder. 
with your, physically that is, the seeds of murder can be exercised physically and with our mouth and our heart. The seeds of murder are envy, anger, pride, revenge, hate, and of course, unforgiveness. And the list goes on. So the challenge my, I'm giving you tonight is I'm going to ask a question. Have you ever broken the sixth commandment? Well, once again, I think maybe every one of us at some time have broken the sixth commandment, particularly when we look at it in the light that Jesus taught. Well, let's remember, we have to value the individual. We become murderers in God's sight if our anger gets out of control. But you see, God forgives murderers if they repent. It may not surprise you, and it may surprise you, in fact, that most of the Bible was written by three men who at one time were murderers. They were Paul, David and Moses. And we know that God forgave them. They are actually cited in the Bible as great men of God. So not only is there a God in heaven, that our God in heaven is a forgiving God. Amen. Let's be comfort, comforted in this. Don't reflect back on the errors that you've made, but be, reflect back on the mercy and the forgiveness of God. So let's summarise things tonight as I finish. Life is from God. We read in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, The Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. It was God's breath that caused him to live, to, li to live. Life is not something we automatically have a right to. It is a gift from God. Every one of us, a gift from God. In Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 it says, so God created man in his own image. God patterned him after himself, male and female, made he them. Wow. We have been made after God's own image. In other words, there's something about us, and I could go very deep into this tonight, but I'm not, but there is certainly things about us that reflect the same image that was in God. We're very much like him in some ways. I'm not saying that we're God's. Certainly not God's. But you know, one of those things is God made us so that we can communicate with him. We can be on the same wavelength. We can talk to him and he can talk to us. So this is just one of the many things about being in God's image. We're very, very special. So there are three reasons that we have looked at tonight that say that human life is sacred. One... God alone has the power to give life and therefore he is the only authority to take it away. The second point is we are made in the image of God. Just talked about that. To take the life of another human is to destroy someone patterned after God who is close to his heart. The third one is that God made us, created us to live together. And he did that so that we can contribute what we are and what we have to others. Let me read to you out of John chapter, sorry, 2 John chapter 1 verses 5 to 6. This is a reflection back to the Old Testament out of the New Testament. 
And now I beseech thee, not as though I wrote a new commandment unto thee, but that which we have heard from the beginning, that we love one another. This is community. We are to love one another. And this is love, that we walk after his commandments. This is the commandment that, as you've heard from the beginning, that you walk in it. And that commandment is that you love one another. Community is to, to love your neighbour. Community is to be in harmony with your neighbour because this was God's plan for man. And murder destroys this interlocking social life together. We're destroying the, the companionship and the, the community that God planned for us to have with other people. Not only do we do that by physical murder, but if we allow hatred to come into our heart and anger which develops in other ways, it de develops things in other ways, then we're breaking that community that God actually planned for us. Have you been angry? Well, we've all been angry at some time or other. Thank God. I don't think there's many amongst us who have gone as far to actually kill somebody physically. But if you've been angry, remember these things. Have, have self-respect and humility. That says have self-respect because when you get angry, you know it's not good. And if we know something's not good, we should have self-respect and correct it. The second is deal with the anger you feel. Don't harbour it. Deal with it. Don't let the sun go down upon your wrath. I personally have felt, yes, I have been angry with people. But in the evening when I pray, I would particularly go out of my way to say to God, yes, I've been angry. And I, sometimes I've even said I had every right to be angry. But... Uh, you know, we need to deal with that anger and say, Lord, I forgive them. Please forgive me. If we forgive, then we don't bear grudges. Some people say, well, I forgave them. But they still bear grudges and, and their grudges are revealed in their actions. We can always find, this is number four, we can always find a way to love somebody. If they're that bad, then feel sorry for them and love them because of that. And finally, desire to be godly. That is, to be godlike. I close with a portion of scripture that talks about the wonderful nature of God and how merciful he has been to us. Psalm 103, verses 8 to 9. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. He will not always chide, neither will he keep his angry anger forever. He had not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. Before you judge somebody else and get angry with somebody else, maybe we should be considering how God could be angry with us. But as we've just read, he has not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. There's a lot in this sixth commandment, a lot more maybe than what we ever dreamed. It would be a good thing to go and, and read Matthew chapter 5 and, and just reflect upon the instruction that God gave us there of how to apply in our lives the Old Testament uh, commandments.
Anyway, God bless you. It's been wonderful to teach you uh, from my heart. I've spoken tonight. I haven't said this because I'm perfect in any way. None of us are perfect. But God is perfect. And the wonderful thing he's perfect about is that he's merciful and always ready to forgive. And therefore, we should be ready to forgive. Let's pray. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for this lesson tonight. Yes, Lord, we have opened your scriptures. You've breathed words into our hearts tonight. And we can only pray, Lord, please help me. As much, Lord, as, as we know that, that to physically kill someone would be very bad. Help us to understand, Lord, if we have wrong attitudes, if we have bad feelings about people, that, Lord, this is a sign that our heart is not right with you and that, Lord, maybe we are murdering them in our hearts. So, our God, we pray that you would help us, pray that you would be with us. The other lessons we've learned in the past weeks on this subject and the lessons we'll learn in the near future, help us to take them from our, to close to our hearts so that we can have healthy families, healthy, godly families. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.